If I may, I would like to uh, uh, just finish uh, what I propose to do tonight, just very briefly. I, I would like to talk about Joel and Zechariah. Last time I was with you, mainly we talked about uh, Daniel. You remember we finished up talking about Daniel, and about uh, how that in Daniel you have the, the four, uh, four, er, for, well, it's the four parts of the image, you remember? The head of gold and the chest of the, and arms of bronze and the, the, and the uh, thighs of silver, and then you remember you had the legs of iron and uh, the toes, of ten toes, and so on. And we, so, and we talked about the world empires and the, how it, when you come to chapter 7, those uh, four parts of the beast are, are seen as the four. Uh, four parts of the image are seen as the four beasts, the lion, Babylon, and the, the, the bear, Medo-Persia, and the leopard uh, with uh, uh, Greece, and then the indescribably terrible beast, the Roman Empire, and so on. Uh, and then we noticed, uh, we talked about the 70 weeks, remember, okay. And then we went to Ezekiel and we talked about the New Covenant, and you remember the wonderful uh, thing that God is going to do for Israel in the coming day and giving them a new heart and putting his spirit within them, causing them to love his laws and to prosper them both physically, materially, and spiritually. Then we looked at the Valley of Dry Bones and returned to the land and the revival of Israel when God breathed spiritual life in them. We looked at the Gog Magog War in chapter 38 and then the last uh, uh, nine chapters have to do with uh, the uh, millennial temple and millennial kingdom. So we looked at all that. We talked about that in Daniel uh, and uh, 70 weeks. Key passages in Joel. If you look at the, the book of Joel, the word Joel, the J-O part, means Jehovah or Yahweh, the I am, uh, the Lord, capital L, capital L, capital R, capital D. And then the L part is L O R L or Elohim, which means the mighty one. And I have suggested to you that uh, that it's really a title of, of Jehovah, and it means the mighty ones, the majestic one, uh, majestic ones in the Trinity in the plural, three persons. Now we were noticing, I think, that the day of the Lord, the day of Jehovah, the Yom Yahweh, occurs five times in Joel. In three chapters, you've got this expression, the day of the Lord. And in chapter one, it, it's seen as a time of terrible horror. Uh, the, it's, we see a plague of insects, and uh, there are those three stages of, it's either three different insects, most expository day, I think it's three stages of one insect where they eat the vegetation, and then what's left of that, the next uh, stage of their growth eats the next part of the vegetation, and the, the last stage of their growth, uh, they eat everything. So the land is left without anything to sustain life. Uh, and th this, of course, reminds us of what we've been noticing with regard to the day of the Lord. It's a day of judgment, a day of wrath, a day of punishment, uh, and a day of horror. Uh, so we have famine, and of course, as you know, what results from famine, you've got uh, 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 death and plague and sickness and uh, just uh, in inflation and uh, economic realm and all that sort of thing. So that, that is a picture of the day of the Lord in chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, the uh, uh, invasion of insects turns into an, an invading army, uh, a ter tremendous and uh, incredibly uh, fierce army. Uh, they, the, the description of them is, is quite striking. And many people have drawn a lot of uh, inferences from that. that they, they, they climb upon the walls and they climb in the windows. And it seems as though they're partly aerial. It could be a, uh, actually uh, an, a, a, a military force that is made up of, uh, of airplanes and helicopters and all that sort of thing. And we'll probably be looking a little bit, little bit more at that when we look further at the, the day of Revelation. And, uh, Zechariah. So there's a, this is a tremendous invading army you see coming against Israel. And then in chapter 3, we have this picture of universal judgment. And uh, 
it's really a, a corresponding passage of scripture that corresponds with what the Lord Jesus describes in Matthew 25, where he, we see him returning in the clouds of glory and he sets up his throne of glory. Remember his throne of glory, not the bema that's in heaven seven years before for the church, but now it's the judgment of the living nations on earth and he sets up the throne of his glory on Mount Zion, on earth, and he judges all the nations. And, and just look at that for a moment in, in, in Joel chapter 3. Uh, there's just a little expression I want you to look at in the, the beginning of the chapter 2. We can find Joel here. Sometimes it's difficult to just remember which minor prophet comes before which one. But in Joel chapter 3, just before Amos, notice an expression before we come to this uh, judgment seat. But look at Joel chapter 3 and verse uh, 2. Notice the heading, verse 1, it's in those days at that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. He says, I will gather, the Lord speaking, I will get, also gather all nations, all nations. Notice that, because we're going to be coming to that tomorrow, Lord willing, when we're talking about Armageddon. Tomorrow I want to talk basically about three subjects, the tribulation, that is the first half of the 70th week, the first three and a half years, and then the great tribulation of the last three and a half years, or the time and times and half a time, or 42 months, or the 1260 days, all the same period of time. Uh, and then I want to talk about Armageddon and the following events. So here we have all nations, all nations gathered against Jerusalem. Uh, and I, he says, I will also gather all nations. And in Matthew 25, as he sits on the throne of his glory, all nations are judged. He said, I'll bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. I take that to be the valley of Jezreel. Nobody's ever quite apparently figured that out, but it has to be when you look at other scriptures, that area. Uh, really the valley that stretches from Petra down uh, in the, the country of Jordan now, in the south uh, east corner of uh, Israel. Uh, actually in Jordan, that am amazing place that I've always longed to see and in all my visits to Israel, I've never got there. So I'll get there in the, in the millennium, no doubt. Anyway, so anyway, if you go from there, way down the southeast corner, can you picture it in your mind, of Israel up to Armageddon, that's about 1,600 furlongs or, or 186 miles where the blood will flow to the horses valleys. And that's the valley that's talked about here on Dudley. He says, I will bring all the nations down there into the valley of Jehoshaphat. So can you picture the Lord Jesus sitting on the throne of his glory? And I believe this will be literally fulfilled. I can't explain all the logistics, but this is going to happen. The scripture says so. And I will plead with them for my people. So here is game. You see how this ties in with the what is stated in Matthew 25, that they're going to be judged and divided into sheep and goats based on how they treated his people, his brethren. Remember, did when they, his brethren were persecuted, when, did they give them a drink of water? Did they give them clothing? Did they visit them in sickness? Did they visit them in prison? Or did they take sides with the Antichrist? This, through all scripture, has always been the deciding point. Did uh, you decide to take sides with Christ and his people, or did you decide to take uh, sides with the beast, with Satan, and with his people? And so here it is, Cain, and I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now there is a, there, that expression, I'm going to judge them for parting my land. And what are, what are, what are, are the nations of the world discussing right now? The United Nations and America and, you know, this road to peace and all this sort of thing. Well, if you will divide the land and, and, and you will give, give the, the Palestinians, and they've already given them a tremendous amount, if you will give them parts of Gaza, if you give them part of Jerusalem, and if you'll give them part of the West Bank, and this, that, then we will have a peace treaty. 
of course, it's all alive. And going even further back than that is striking. You remember the Balfour, Balfour Agreement, Great Britain, in the First World War, the end of the First World War, they agreed to give Israel the land, basically, that is theirs in the Bible, the land that stretches from Egypt and right up to, into Lebanon and across to the Euphrates, taking in Jordan and right <laughs> over to the borders of the Euphrates. And then the Brit Great Britain went back on that treaty. And uh, Churchill was involved in that, although he was a friend of Israel, but he, politically he was powerless to stop it. And, and since that time, when they have, in effect, cursed Israel, they have gone back on their agreement with Israel, United, the, the British Empire has just gone down the tube. And I believe that book has been true of nations all through time. Those that have blessed Israel, God has blessed, and those that have not blessed Israel, God has not blessed them. And so we see here that this judgment, God is going to judge the nations for how they treated Israel in dividing the land. Now, what I want to look at for just a moment, though, is, is uh, look at uh, verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, among the nations, that go and prepare war. Wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. This is the opposite of what we've got in the, the later minor prophets. Beat your swords into plowshares. Here it's beat your plowshares into swords. Arm yourselves to the teeth and your pruning hooks unto spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come on me to heathen. And gather yourselves together round about thither. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened. Weakened, sorry. No, wakened and come to, up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And I point out that word decision means the valley of judgment. For the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord will roar out of Zion uh, and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So here is the judgment of the living nations based on how they treated his brethren, his people, how they tr treated Israel. And the uh, nations will be divided into the sheep and the goats, as in Matthew 25. And th the last verses of Joel describe the blessing that God is going to bring upon Israel at that time. Then I'd like to look at, uh, briefly, at Zechariah. Zechariah is one of the most amazing uh, books in the Old Testament. In, the, in Zechariah, remember, Zechariah was given 10 visions in one night. That must have been quite a night for Zechariah, and uh, I don't know, I don't know what kind of dreams and nightmares and happy dreams you have, but uh, they, they can be, they can really affect a person quite profoundly. So Zechariah is given ten visions from the Lord, and you remember some of the outstanding visions here uh, are concerning world empires. Once again, we have this number four coming up. Remember, we met it in Daniel. Daniel saw four succeeding world empires. There was Babylon that was in existence when he was uh, living, and then there was Medo-Persia, which, and he was still living at the beginning of that one under Cyrus, Darius, or Darius, how do you pronounce it? Wish to. Uh, and then there was the empire of Grecia coming, and the empire of Rome. And the scripture explains that there's a revived Roman Empire. This is the empire that was and is and shall be. Okay, so we have these four horns representing four empires, and we have four carpenters, rather interesting. Don't have five, don't have three, four. And of course, Babylon, the carpenter there that cut down the horn, the power of Babylon was Medo-Persia. And then you have the horn Medo-Persia and the carpenter that that cut down the power of Medo Persia was Grecia. We talked about the, that Alexander the Great and with the, the great horn, you remember, had that attacks the, the uh, ram in Daniel chapter 8. And then, of course, you have uh, 
the uh, power or the horn of Grisha. It is cut down by the uh, carpenter of Rome. And then finally, Rome in its revived form, as we see it in, in uh, uh, Revelation 17, 18, and so on. It's cut down by the stone cut out with out hands, the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus, the ancient of days, and uh, an everlasting kingdom is set up. What, one of the most striking things we see in Zechariah is the tribulation that Israel is going to go through. One of the questions tonight has to do with uh, uh, how, what does it mean that all Israel shall be saved? Well, let's look for a moment at Zechariah, just to have time to go into it in any detail. But look at Isaiah, or Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. Uh, and look at, just look at uh, some of the things it says here. Uh, the Lord in previous passage has described the, the, the uh, tribulation and the great tribulation that Israel is going to go through and how the, the, uh, the people will be uh, brought into a, a war in which uh, the, the horses will be blinded and the people, their eyes will melt in their eye sockets and uh, they will just virtually melt where they're standing. And uh, the, the, the horror of this judgment is, is indescribable. But uh, notice how he did, uh, describes this uh, tribulation that Israel is going to go through in uh, the very last of the tribulation period. Look at Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 8. And it says, And it shall come to pass that in all the lands of the Lord, Two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined. Think of that, the refining fire of God's judgment on Israel at this time. If we were to look at Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 34 to 38, we would see a description of how God is going to judge his own people, Israel and Judah. And this is a, another description of it. I will refine them as silver is refined. When silver is refined, there's a terrific heat, a terrific fire that there that silver is put through. So they're going to be refined that way. And I will try them as gold is, ref is tried. And they shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my, my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. So in this time of terrible, terrible tribulation, time of Jacob's trouble, they're, they're going to be refined by the Lord. And then look at chapter 14. Behold the day of the Lord. Here it is. Yom Yahweh again. The day of the Lord. Capital for L-O-R-D. The day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations. Here it is again. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord, Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Now I'm hoping to give you a, a basic outline of the, the geography of this when we look at uh, Armageddon and the events that follow uh, tomorrow, Lord willing. And his feet shall stand, the Lord Jesus' feet shall stand on that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. I remember a couple of times, three or four times, I've only visited Israel twice, but each time my feet have stood on, those, on that mountain, it would be quite thrilling to think that someday, and I think very soon, the Lord's feet are going to stand on that mountain, and it's going to split in two. Look, it says it's going to happen then. But, um, this shall, and um, the Mount of Olives shall cleave, shall split in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed, shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. So it's, there's really an east-west valley here. And 
Notice what happens as well. When you shall flee, that the, I take these are the, the faithful remnant that God will rescue, and you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach uh, unto Azeoth. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with him. Isn't that interesting? And all the holy ones with him. So I think we'll be there, undoubtedly, and the angels will be there, the armies of heaven will be there. And it's rather interesting that uh, uh, we have that mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that there's going to be this worldwide army come, and uh, all nations, it says, are going to gather against Jerusalem, and the Lord is going to intervene, and he is going to uh, deliver the faithful ones of Israel. And it shall come to pass on that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord. Remember all the signs in the heavens and the earth and the light sources are going to be affected, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and so on. That day, uh, we noticed that before, and it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, to the Jehovah, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. So the, the heavens and the light sources are going to be affected. This is going to be interesting. And it shall be in that day, that's the day of the Lord, that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, I take that to be the Mediterranean, and half of them toward the hinder sea, in some shall it be. So all year long, there's going to be this flowing of water between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea, and the whole Jordan system is going to be changed completely. And the Lord shall be king. Notice again, Jehovah shall be king, the Jehovah shall be king over all the earth in that day, and there shall be one Jehovah, one Lord, and his name one. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up. Notice there's going to be a change in the whole topography of the land of Israel here. The, the, uh, the land shall be lifted up. I take it that there's going to be a huge uh, plateau which will be the new Mount Zion, in which the Millennial Temple will be placed, and uh, that, I, I think, it will be uh, north and west of the present Jerusalem, but we haven't time to go into the details of that now. But it, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in their place, from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine press. And men shall dwell in it, Jerusalem will be dwelt in again. You remember the New Jerusalem, the Messiah? I saw the New Jerusalem and children playing there. Here it is. There's the, the scripture where it comes from. And it shall be inhabited, and um, men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more war, uh, no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. We were mentioning that. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. So there's going to be horrific judgment on those that oppose Israel. Uh, in fact, when you come to Revelation, we see the sword going out of the Lord's mouth as he returns in glory and in vengeance and smites the armies of the beast and of the false prophet. And here it is. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. So the Lord will cause this confusion, as he did in several of the battles recorded in Old Testament times. And Judah shall fight at and Judah shall also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come up, which came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, the Jehovah of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be the those that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, 
even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, and of course Egypt wouldn't be bothered if there were no rain because they have the Nile River. I guess they will have the Nile River even in the millennial period. So it says here that if they won't come up, then the Lord won't, uh, uh, won't punish them by lack of rain because that would be no punishment. But he will send another punishment upon them. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So one, I noticed in one of the questions, there was a question about will there be sin in the millennial period? Well, here you have it. Some nations and some peoples will be sinful and will be rebellious and will be disobedient. But notice that righteousness will reign. There will be instant punishment for these people. Uh, in that day, Verse 20, shall there be upon the bells of the horses, holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. So everything will be uh, for the Lord's glory. And yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seed therein. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So... Everything will be under divine rule and divine control. But there will be rebellion, there will be sin, and at the end of the millennium, of course, the saint will be released and he will lead an army against the Lord. So uh, that sort of concludes what I wanted to say about uh, the uh, uh, matter tonight. And tomorrow I'd like to look at First of all, the tribulation time, the first three and a half years of tribulation, and then secondly, the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, and then the battle of Armageddon and the following events. So if that's okay with everybody, I'd like to go on to questions that were handed in. One here that's uh, quite uh, discerning, and uh, we've already talked about it a little. It says, what does it mean that all Israel shall be saved, Romans 11? And that's an excellent question. What does it mean that all Israel shall be saved? Uh, the, um, I think it, it fits in perfectly with what we've just been talking about. The Lord is going to come, He's going to return, and uh, He is going to deliver His people uh, in that day of great tribulation. And there's just one scripture I'd like you to look at before we look at the prophetic angle of it. Look at the theological angle of it. Look at Romans uh, chapter 2 for a moment to see what, what is meant by Israel. And Paul deals with this again in Romans chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. But he says here in Romans chapter 2 and verse 28, For he is not a Jew or an Israelite, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. That's not the circumcision that God wants from his people, the, the cutting off uh, from uh, that which is evil. Uh, he wants an inward circumcision. And so Paul says in verse 29, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So I take it here that by Israel, Paul is talking about those who are faithful to the Lord, the remnant that really trust in the Lord. And uh, we see that again in Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, as we mentioned. Uh, Paul says, look, every son of Abraham is not really an Israelite. There was, there was Ishmael. He was a son of Abraham. So you can't base the fact that you are a, a child of God on the fact that, that you are a physical descendant of Abraham. And so I think what he's talking about here is the, the faithful Israel, the remnant. All through the Old Testament scriptures, we read of the remnant, the remnant. God is going to save the remnant. And uh, in Zechariah, where we've just reading, been reading, we notice there that, that there is a remnant. Uh, a large percentage of Israel is judged and cut off, but there is a remnant that is saved. We see that in Ezekiel 
chapter 5 too, where you remember Ezekiel is told to take, take the hairs of his beard and to chop them in three and then to take one third and scatter them to the winds and one third to burn in the fire and then chop up the others and sew them into his garment. And only a few of all of Israel is really going to be saved. So what does it mean that all Israel shall be saved? Well, all of the real Israel, the real believers, the, the faithful of Israel, the remnant of Israel will be saved in that day. And uh, in Romans chapter 11 and verse 26, where we read that statement, as we may notice, it says in Romans 11 and 26, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is what we've got in the, uh, the uh, 70th week of Daniel, remember at the end of the 70th week it says that God is going to uh, finish the transgression, he's going to cleanse the nation, and when he establishes a new covenant with Israel, he's going to give them a new heart, and he's going to write his laws in their hearts, and they're going to be his people. This, I believe, is what is meant by Israel. I know the word all is a difficult one there, but I believe that is the meaning. Uh, some other questions here? Uh, and I don't pretend to be able to answer every question to your satisfaction by any means, but anyway. Who are the two witnesses during the tribulation? That's something we're coming to hopefully tomorrow, briefly. Uh, who are the two witnesses during the revelation? Are they only witnesses to Israel or all nations? Well, uh, let me just suggest to you that uh, many uh, Commentators have commented on this, and if I knew the answer, I guess uh, I could. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I could pose as, as a wise, be wiser than Solomon. But from the description of the miracles, there's no doubt the person who asked this is probably aware. Uh, from the description of the miracles that they perform, uh, that they're able to withhold the rain and they're able to uh, turn the waters into blood and, and this sort of thing. Uh, it looks as though they are Moses and Elijah. From another point of view, it looks as though they must be uh, Enoch and Elijah, because Enoch and Elijah were the only two, one, two men recorded in the Old Testament uh, that never died. And the scripture says that it is appointed unto man once to die. So if that is so, then here these two witnesses be, would be ones that had not died. And then at the end, you remember, of the uh, uh, 1260 days, the three and a half years, the beast is allowed to overcome them and they die. And they're actually raptured. They're rather interesting, eh? They rise from the dead and then they're raptured. <coughs> so could be that they are uh, Enoch and Elijah, the two that have never died. And I don't know the answer. If someone here knows, anyone <laughs> got a comment now on who it might be? One of the comments of William Newell, he said it's probably either Enoch or Elijah, or Mo Mo Moses and Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. So. Was that right? That's the full extent of the conversation is which pair. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. It looks very much as though Elijah's in there anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've read some other rather convincing explanations and I can't just remember all the details of those now. But uh, I think that's one of the uh, things that we don't know yet. <laughs> uh, interesting, we're noticing, I think, that in Daniel, Daniel was about to write some things that were revealed to him, and the, the Lord said, no, don't write those now. Uh, they won't be known until the end time. And uh, we probably know some of those when we come to the book of Revelation. Uh, and then when uh, the Apostle John was uh, writing the book of Revelation, you remember that when the seven th the thunders uttered their voices, he was about to write down what the thunders said, and he was told, no, don't tell that now. That's not uh, 
information that is to be given at this time. So this may be one of the points that we have to wait to see. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, so uh, who are the two witnesses? And the short answer is I can't tell you the definite answer. <laughs> Even the father would break at you. <laughs> Apparently so. Are they only witnessing to Israel? I think that is clear, or to all nations. I believe it's clear that they're witnessing to all nations because all, because all the nations of the world rejoice when they, they're finally slain. And remember, they have a Christmas party, they give gifts to one another. It's like the, the Feast of Purim in the days of Esther. They're so happy that these two witnesses that convicted them of their sin and of the judgment that was coming, that they are, are overjoyed when they die. So I think it, that they were witnesses to all nations. They will be witnesses to all nations. And the people who are saved during the tribulation, are they saved by believing in Christ, uh, redeeming blood, or are they saved only to God's kingdom, but not to, to the church, to Christ's bride? And uh, I, that's a, a good question. We, I think the scripture is quite clear, and we've been trying to emphasize this, that the only people who are Christ's bride are those who are his body. And uh, of course, this is a theme that goes all through scripture, right from Adam and Eve on. Ye shall be one flesh, they shall be one flesh. So we are, we are one with Christ because we are baptized by the Spirit of God into one body, in, in one spirit, the power of one spirit, Christ baptized in, us into his own body. Christ is a baptizer, Billy Joel points out in his book on the Holy Spirit, person and work. Um, the title of that is God in Us, by the way. So I take it that uh, the, only the church, only the bride, only his body uh, is raptured. And uh, so this leaves a question that is raised here. Uh, how are the people saved during the tribulation period? And uh, are they part of the body that is raptured? No, I don't believe anybody but the born again people from the Pentecost, the birthday of the church, I take it, when the Holy Spirit descended, and the Holy Spirit had a relationship with uh, men that he never had before and never will have after the rapture to future saints. Uh, so all those who were justified by faith before the church and all before Pentecost and all those who were justified by faith after the church is raptured, they are not part of the church, they're not part of the bride, they're not part of the body. They are redeemed by the blood of Christ, though, during the tribulation period, to answer this other question. Because it says that they, they gave witness, uh, and their witness was based on the, the blood of Christ, and uh, the redemption in Christ, and they gave their lives for that reason. Uh, and they, they, are, they will be saved, I believe, as everyone outside of the church, to, to God's kingdom, as it's put in this question. Uh, theirs, I believe, will be an earthly kingdom. Uh, we notice that in Matthew 25, where these people um, are, uh, they are martyred and others that endure to the end and are saved, uh, go into the kingdom uh, prepared of the Father from the foundation of the world, from the foundation of the world, not from before the foundation of the world, but, the church, as we mentioned, is chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. From before the world began, as is put place in Timothy and Titus, before ages of times. But uh, these people, I believe, will go into a, an earthly kingdom. The sheep go into an, an earthly kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world by the Father. But they are, they, they are uh, saved by faith in Christ. I wish I could just point out that that scripture exactly, I'll look it up, uh, and give you the exact reference. Uh, so I think that's the answer to those questions. Now, question number two, New Jerusalem, street of gold, is it only seen in heaven? Uh, does it appear at the rapture, the end of the tribulation, uh, or the day, the day of God when heaven and earth pass away? This is really one of the key questions, uh, just where, do some of these prophecies apply? In Isaiah, the last chapter, two chapters of Isaiah, we read of new heavens and new earth, and yet the new heavens and new earth seem to be new in the sense that God brings in a new uh, era to earth, and that he's talking about the millennial period. 
uh, where people uh, live to be 100 years old and, they, and if they die at 100, they're considered to, be, to die as a child because there's sin then. Uh, you see, I think we have the fundamental <coughs> theological uh, truth here that though everyone who enters into the millennial kingdom is redeemed, uh, the children that are born during the millennial period are still children of Adam, and in Adam all die. They have to make a choice. And that choice is reflected, of course, when Satan is released from the uh, uh, bottomless pit, from Tartarus, from the deep, uh, from uh, when uh, uh, at the end of the millennial period. And those people who choose to not really give themselves to the Lord or trust in the Lord, follow Satan. And they uh, compass the camp of the saints about in the holy city. And fire comes down from heaven and consumes them. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, well, how do you get out of that? Uh, yeah, oh, this, uh, I'm answering it. Another question, I'm in there. The New Jerusalem, okay. Uh, is it only seen in heaven? Better get back to that one. Uh, the scripture makes it clear that the all of the uh, material, if we can use that word, that the New Jerusalem is made of, the street of gold, and the foundations of those beautiful uh, precious stones, and uh, the gates of pearl, uh, all of that radiates and reflects and emits the glory and the light of God. Uh, so I think this answers the question. The, 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 there's no need of the, 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 the uh, sun by day or the moon by night because the, the, the glory of God shines out from the New Jerusalem. And that, that radiates, as we're noticing from Isaiah, radiates over the whole world, especially uh, the, uh, the land of Israel and the land of Judah. But uh, is it only seen in heaven? No, I don't think so. Because it comes down from God out of heaven. And you remember the Apostle John has said, you want to see the, the, the bride the, of the Lamb, the Lamb's wife, and he's taken up, as we mentioned, into an exceedingly high mountain. And there he sees the city coming down, coming down. So, I take it to be a satellite city, New Jerusalem, the primary dwelling place of the bride, of the lamb's wife, of the bride of the, the lamb, and I believe its glory will affect the whole of planet Earth during the millennial period. And then, of course, in the day of God, this is an interesting one, and it's hard to figure out the logistics here. It seems that when fire comes down from God out of heaven to destroy Satan when he's released from the bottomless pit, uh, and uh, he is uh, uh, cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet have been already been suffering for a thousand years. By the way, that's a very interesting statement because if the Jehovah Witnesses tell you that the Bible doesn't talk about people uh, having conscious suffering in the, in the lake of fire, here are two undoubtedly human beings, the beast and the false prophet, and they have been suffering for a thousand years in the lake of fire, not in the bottomless pit. Satan's been in the bottomless pit. Then he joins them. He's cast into the lake of fire. And there are a number of other cults, some that are really quite uh, true in doctrine in many ways, like the Seventh-day Adventists that deny eternal punishment. They believe in soul sleep and annihilation. So this is interesting. Uh, the... Um, Undoubtedly, the, the New Jerusalem would also be uh, present on the new earth in the day of God when the, there is new heavens and new earth. Then there's a question number three. The beast, Antichrist, false prophet, are they Satan in human form? Uh, it says in, in Revelation 13 where uh, uh, it first talks about uh, the beast as the Antichrist uh, the, with the seven heads and the ten horns and the crowns on the ten horns. It says that 
that all the power of the dragon of Satan is given unto him. So I take it that he is basically Satan incarnate on earth. Uh, and we see a, a tremendously interesting parallel between the trinity of righteousness, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the dragon in Revelation 12, the great red dragon, which is Satan, uh, Satanus, and Abaddon, and is uh, the devil, the deceiver, Diabolos. Uh, and uh, he corresponds, if we may say it reverently, to the Father in a picture. He is the, the spirit being behind the, the other two members of this trinity of evil. He is the one who has uh, existed for ages, not forever, but for ages. He has existed during the times of the seven heads, the, the kingdom of Egypt, the kingdom of Syria, Syria, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of Medo-Persia, the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of Rome, and the revived Roman Empire. So that's why when we see his picture, we see him with the crowns on the seven heads, not on the horns, but on the heads, because he has been the, the, the power behind all of these kingdoms, this, these satanic kingdoms, this world, which is in the hands of the evil one, like a, a baby in the hands of a mother. He controls. He's the prince of the power of the air. He is the prince, the ruler of this world. And he has been that way for, for thousands of years. And in a way, you see the significance of this when, when Adam chose to rebel against God. In effect, he turned over the human race to Satan. And so when, for instance, at the, at the, tribula, at the temptation of Christ, when he said, look, you just bow, said to the Lord Jesus, you just bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all <laughs> the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. The Lord didn't say, no, no, you can't do that. They aren't yours to give me. He just said, look, quoted from Scripture. The Scripture says, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So, you see, uh, as I see it here, uh, we've got this, this spiritual power that has existed for thousands of years, and all of his power is given to the beast, his throne and his kingdom and his rule and his authority is given to the beast, this seven-headed uh, seven beast. And uh, he shares that by placing uh, the crowns on ten horns, the ten kings that rule with him. But the, the incarnation, I take it, of, of Satan, this, this beast that, whom I call the Antichrist, I know there's a great debate about whether he's really the Antichrist or the false prophet is the Antichrist. And great teachers like Darby and Gabeline and so on said, no, it's the false prophet who is the Antichrist because he's the one that corresponds to Christ. I don't see it quite that way. And uh, uh, the, as, as I see it, if we may again speak reverently, you've got the incarnation of this spiritual power in a man, a human man, and uh, we see a parallel with that in the Trinity of Righteousness. We have the incarnation of God the Father in the Lord Jesus. And in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But he is, he, he is the Logos that was made flesh. So here I take it that Satan basically is the incarnation of Satan. That is also said of... Uh, of uh, a similar statement concerning Judas, Judas Iscariot. Uh, he is referred to as Diabolos, as deceiver, as the type, given the title of Satan. It would almost seem that, that in some way uh, he, Satan became incarnate in some way in Judas. And I believe that's true of this uh, beast here. And then there's a question concerning the false prophet. I believe, by the way, in my mind it's quite convincing that this second person of this trinity of evil, the beast, who I believe is, whom I believe is the, who I believe is the uh, Satan incarnate on earth, uh, that uh, uh, he comes out of the Gentile nations. When you look at Revelation chapter 13, 
uh, John says, I stood upon the shores of the sea, the seas are the, the uh, Gentile nations, and I saw come out of the sea, out of the waters, this beast with the seven heads and the ten horns. And the waters, the seas, and scripture always are symbolic of the Gentile nations, not of Israel. Israel is the land. You remember even the Lord Jesus, he was a root out of the dry ground. It's the Eretz, the land, the land of Israel. Israel is associated with the land. And when you come to the false prophet, this third uh, member of the trinity of evil, he comes out of the land. And uh, he's, he undoubtedly, in my opinion, is a, is a Jew. The Jew wouldn't accept any other. And of course, he, he impersonates Christ. This is why I think many commentators like Darby and Gaveline have suggested that that since he has two horns, he is the lamb. He, he has the features of a lamb, the appearance of a lamb. He has the appearance of Christ, of Messiah. But he has the mouth of the dragon. He speaks like the dragon. So he again is an impersonation of, of uh, or a personification of the, of the dragon. And these, notice too that in connection with him, that it says that, he has all the power of the first beast, the seven-headed beast with the ten horns. Uh, he's the first beast that was before him. But that he causes all men to worship the, the beast. So you see, his function, his role, is similar to the role of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity of Righteousness. Because the role of the, the Holy Spirit is to cause all men to give glory to the Son. Lord Jesus said, he shall glorify me. He shall teach you things concerning me. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. Not to draw attention to himself. Now we have to realize fully that the Holy Spirit is fully God. And is co-equal with the Father and with the Son. And he's called the Kurios, the Lord, the Jehovah in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. And there are many other scriptures that show us that the Holy Spirit is fully God, equal with the Father and with the Son. But his role is not, as in many, again, Pentecostal charismatic circles, to draw attention to himself. His purpose, his role, his desire is to draw attention to the Lord Jesus and to cause people to worship him and to give glory to him. Uh, what is the sequence uh, of their appearance, their appearances? I, as far as I can see, the, the uh, last two members of the Trinity of Evil, the beast and the false prophet, are, arise at approximately the same time. Uh, the, they're mentioned at the same time in Revelation, but you've also got to realize this, that it is at this time when the beast takes over rule of the whole world, for 42 months, for three and a half years, time and times and half a time, 1260 days, that is three and a half, 360 day years, uh, that it's at that time that the, I don't think the covenant is broken, but the conditions under the covenant are broken. And the sacrifices of the Israelites in the, in the, the temple, uh, the Antichrist temple, are caused to cease by the beast the sacrifices and the oblations. And if we compare that with Revelation 17, this is a time when uh, the ten kings join with their chief, the Antichrist, the little horn, and they, they uh, rend the, the, the woman, the ecumenical church that rides on the beast, and they burn her flesh uh, with fire. Uh, they, and they, so all religion ceases to exist on planet earth under the antichrist rule except worship of the beast as paul says in second thessalonians chapter 2 uh, verse 4 where he says he will set himself up in the temple of god proclaiming that he is god and demanding worship as god this is the abomination of desolation and it was prefigured by antiochus epiphanes in 168 BC, when he did the same thing, he set up, uh, he slew a pig on the altar, he stopped the Jewish women from circumcising their babies, and he forced them to eat pork and unclean foods, and he set up a, an image of uh, Zeus Olympias in, in, the, in the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem. 
the abomination that makes desolate, the hateful thing to God that causes judgment to come, causes desolation to come. Uh, so this has to happen at the same time because the, the false prophet causes Israel, except the faithful remnant, and causes the whole world, except again those who have been converted through the witness of the faithful Israelites, 144,000 and their converts, he causes them all to worship the beast and to proclaim him as God, God on earth. So their, their appearance would have to be simultaneous at the same time. And so what is the sequence of their appearances? That's the way I see it. Who comes first? Well, the, the beast has, of course, been called, uh, coalescing his kingdom, bringing his kingdom together during the first three and a half years. And it comes to a climax at the end of the first three and a half years when he finally gains control of the whole world and puts down the ecumenical church. And that's an interesting concept. I don't think it's just the Roman Catholic Church. I think Rome and <coughs> Islam and Hinduism and, and uh, New Agers and mystics, they all come together. To, and the Antichrist seems to, to allow them to have their religion, much like Alexander the Great when he, when he conquered the world uh, of his time in the Mediterranean world. He allowed the nations largely to have their own religion and to kind of unite them with uh, the Greek philosophies and religions. So it's going to be, I believe, during the first three and a half years here, uh, the beast will allow a great deal of, of individual worship for the first three and a half years. And we see that in the point that uh, there, there is an Antichrist temple in which there have been offerings and oblations made. How do we know there have been sacrifices made in the, in the Jewish temple in the first three and a half years? Well, because he causes them to cease at the end of the first three and a half years. So they had to, there had to be those during the first three and a half years, right? Uh, so when, when that first three and a half years ends, and he becomes God on earth, and you must worship him and receive his mark, or you've had it, You're, you lose your life, or, and you can't buy and sell unless you have the uh, mark of the beast, then uh, when that, that comes to a climax, then he is recognized as God in, on earth. So, and the false prophet obviously supports him to the hilt, so he has to come at the same time as the uh, climax of the uh, rule of the, the beast when he rules the world. Uh, and did they all, were they all cast into the lake of fire at the same time? No. Uh, it tells us quite clearly in Revelation chapter 20 that Satan is cast into the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit, again, remember, is, in Greek is abyssos. That means without bottom, the bottomless pit, the pit without bottom. It is also called in many scriptures the deep, the deep. Uh, remember that the demons, when Jesus cast them out at, at, uh, the, in the Gadarene region, uh, they pleaded with them and said, don't cast us into the deep before our time. And remember, we'd be noticing that, that uh, this deep, the abyssos, the bottomless pit, is uh, also uh, the, the place that, according to, to the understanding of the Greek language, and I, again, I mentioned I looked this up in my big uh, Liddell and Scott Greek classical and New Testament lexicon dictionary, uh, that this deep, this abyssos, is, is farther below Hades, where the souls of men are at the present time, than Hades is below heaven. And it is the abode of daimons, or heroes, of semi-natural and semi-supernatural beings, and deities and semi-deities. And you have this reflected in Greek and, and Babylonian and uh, other pagan literature, which I take are, are uh, distortions of scriptural truth to a large extent where you have creatures like Achilles, who had, uh, what was it, I think Achilles' mother was a goddess, and his, his uh, father was a human being, and you have people like uh, uh, Hercules, whose father, I think, was Zeus, the king of the gods, and his mother was a human being. So you've got this business that you see, really, 
similarity in Genesis chapter 6 where the sons of God, the Bene Elohim, the uh, term is always used in, in reference to angels, they saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all that they chose. And the result was men of renown, Nephilim, fallen ones who were heroes, who were giants, who were men of tremendous stature. And uh, rather interesting, I have come to the opinion that probably the whole earth was affected by this uh, defilement that Satan brought in in his attempt to defile the seed of the woman. Because it says in Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 7 that no one in his family were righteous in all the earth. Looks as though that was the only family left that wasn't polluted. So that the pollution, you see, it was incredible. Why did all but eight people die in flood? I believe that's the reason. And uh, so uh, Satan is cast into this, this prison house of deities and semi-deities, supernatural and semi-supernatural beings. That's, that's what the Greek people would understand by this when they read these words in the scripture. When they read about Tartarus, that's what they would believe that it meant, this place, the abyssos, the bottomless pit. And it says in 2 Peter 2 and 4 that God tartarized the angels that sinned. Now these must have been these angels because the majority of angels as we're noticing are free in the heavens and there's warfare between the angels of Satan and the angels of God until the middle of the tribulation when Satan is cast down to the earth and a third of the stars I take that them to be the, the disobedient angels with them but not these angels these angels Peter and Jude said have been committed into chains or caves of darkness until the judgment of the great day so they are imprisoned. This is where they're imprisoned, in Tartarus, in the deep, in the abyssos. <clears throat> I think that's fairly clear from Scripture. But remember that at the end of the thousand years, Satan is released from the uh, bottomless pit, from Tartarus, from the abyssos. And after he makes war against uh, the saints and the holy city, fire comes down from heaven and destroys the... the armies of Satan, and he is taken, and he is cast into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet, where they have been tormented for a thousand years. Interesting. Okay, time is up. So I think I've answered, or tried to answer all those questions. I, I haven't answered them. Oh, here's some others. Talk a bit about the millennium. Who populates the earth? Well, we mentioned that in the millennium, the, the uh, saints that are resurrected at the end of the tribulation period, the, the judgment of the living nations, and the people that have lived through the tri tribulation, the great tribulation, will go into the millennium. All will be uh, saints, all will be holy ones uh, during the millennium, the beginning of the millennium. But then, who populates the earth? Well, they will have children. And uh, that's one of the reasons for believing that there's a uh, uh, period of time between uh, the end of the tribulation and the uh, uh, end of the millennium. The, uh, no doubt there will be a huge population of the earth. There probably was a huge population of the earth before the flood too, when people lived a thousand years and you had uh, pleasant conditions of planet earth compared to today. Uh, no doubt there will be a vast multitude of people who will populate the earth during the millennium. What happens to the martyrs from the tribulation? It tells us in Revelation chapter 20 that they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. What role does the, do the, the raptured believers play? I believe the raptured believers are going to primarily dwell with the Lord Jesus in the New Jerusalem, in this beautiful satellite city that radiates the glory of God over the whole earth. Uh, and they will no doubt be coming and going uh, there are gates in the New Jerusalem, 12 gates, you remember? I believe it's quite clear that there are gates of ingress where people go in uh, from earth. And uh, there, there are also gates of egress where people come out from uh, the heavenly city to earth. And I believe personally, looking at the last part of Ezekiel, that it will be resurrected David who will reign on planet earth. And I believe the Lord Jesus will reign over planet earth. And there will be no doubt a good deal of communication 
between resurrected David and the heavenly David, our Lord Jesus, in the holy city. That's a picture I get. You might question that, and I can't prove all of it, but that's an impression I get from the scripture. Uh, where do they live? Well, the saints will live primarily in the New Jerusalem, undoubtedly. Uh, that is the, the, the bride, that's where we see the bride, that's where we see the Lamb's wife. Uh, how do we know that there will be marriage, birth, and death? I uh, take that to me during the millennial period. Well, when we read of the description of the millennial period in Isaiah, as we mentioned, a person will uh, have be considered to have died as a child if he dies at 100 years of age, and that will be because he has not been obedient to the Lord. So there will be uh, judgment for people who decide to reject obeying the Lord during that period. Uh, and uh, there's, there's, there have to be people born during that period because you have the rebellion at the end of the period. If everybody that goes into the millennium, and I think if you add up the numbers in Scripture, you see that everybody that goes into the millennium is redeemed, uh, is justified, then where do these people come from that uh, compose the rebellious forces at the end of the millennium? They have to be born during that period, don't they? Okay. And is forgiveness from sin still necessary? During the uh, millennial period, yes. Uh, I think that would be an inescapable conclusion. Uh, there will no doubt be people who will again have free will to either accept or reject the, the Lord during the millennial period. And if they, they will still be sinners because all men are born sinners. They're still children of Adam. So they're born into this and they're conceived again, let me emphasize that, with a sinful nature, and they're gestated, they're shaped in iniquity. So they're, they're conceived as sinners, they are sinners. If they decide to follow the Lord and trust in the Lord, that will get, bring about forgiveness of their sins. And when does the new covenant with Israel start? The, the one mentioned in Ezekiel 36, although it's not named by that, there it obviously is, mentioned in Jeremiah 31, 31. Isaiah 61, the everlasting covenant. I believe it starts basically at the beginning of the millennium. That's when, when the God uh, saves all of Israel. All of the faithful remnant of Israel are saved. They go into the millennial period and they are justified and they are, have been obedient. They love the Lord and they, have, uh, they are given a, a new heart. And not only that, they are given material prosperity during the millennial period, such as is promised in Ezekiel chapter 36 and uh, back in Jeremiah chapter 31 and other references to the new covenant. So anyway, that's some of that you may question. You may question me. You may question uh, what the scriptures exactly mean by <coughs> many of these points. But uh, that is the general impression I get. And I hope that it will be wrapped up tomorrow talk about the tribulation, the great tribulation, battle of Armageddon, and the events following. And there's some rather interesting points in connection with that for me, I think, and for you. So thank you very much for coming tonight and for your attention. Let's pray. Father, we just praise you again for gathering us together, a few of your redeemed ones, Lord, and we thank thee again for the revelation of your word that you have given us, Lord. We praise you most of all that reveals the Lord Jesus to us, the witness to Jesus is the spirit of prophecy of all that you have told forth and all that you are foretelling, Lord. We thank thee, our God, that all your pleasure is found in him. And Lord, we're just convicted again as we think of these things that all our pleasure should be found in him as well, Lord. That we should delight ourselves in the Lord and he will give us the desires of our heart. Not necessarily material desires, we realize, but that he will give us the deepest uh, joys and the deepest pleasures if we commune with thee and we delight in him. Lord, we just thank thee that thy delight is in him. We thank thee that thou art willing to give him for us to suffering and death. We thank thee for his victory. We thank thee, Lord, that it is thy written word that thy Holy Spirit has used to reveal your love to us through the Lord Jesus and has revealed the Savior to us and brought us into fellowship with thyself and with him and Establish the new covenant with us, which we are experiencing in a limited way now, and we will 
to experience in fullness when we come into thy presence. So Lord, we just ask you to part us with thy blessing, Lord, and to watch over us for good and to bless us on the morrow if the Lord be not come. And to bless all your people here. We think of the people who were at the funeral today, Lord, this large funeral, Lord, of Sister Croswell, Lord, that you would just bless that family and all those that are connected with us, and Lord. Save the, uh, the unsaved ones that are amongst them, Lord, we pray. So we just give thee our praise now and ask thy blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for your patience and spirit. So then we looked at the Valley of Dry Bones and returned to the land and the revival of Israel when God breathed spiritual life in them. We looked at the God made God born, chapter 38, and then the last uh, uh, nine chapters have to do with uh, the uh, Millennial Temple and the Millennial Kingdom. So we looked at all that. We talked about that in Daniel uh, and uh, 70 weeks. Key passages in Joel. If you look at the, the book of Joel, the word Joel, the J O part means Jehovah or Yahweh, the I am, uh, the Lord, capital L, capital L, capital R, capital D. And then the L part is L O R L or Elohim, which means the mighty one. And I, have suggested to you that uh, that is really a title of uh, Jehovah, and it means the mighty ones, the majestic one, uh, majestic ones in the Trinity, in the plural, three persons. Now we were noticing, I think, that the day of the Lord, the day of Jehovah, the Yom Yahweh, occurs five times in Joel. In three chapters, you've got this expression, the day of the Lord, and in chapter one. It's seen as a time of terrible horror. Uh, the, it's a, we see a plague of insects, and uh, there are those three stages of, it's either three different insects, most expository day, I think it's three stages of one insect where they eat the vegetable or that. Uh, we look further at the, the day of Revelation and uh, uh, prophets, Zechariah. So there's a, this is a tremendous invading army you see coming against Israel. And then in chapter 3, we have this picture of universal judgment. And uh, it's really uh, a corresponding passage of scripture that corresponds with what the Lord Jesus describes in Matthew 25, where he, we see him returning in the clouds of glory and he sets up his throne of glory. Remember his throne of glory, not the bema that's in heaven seven years before for the church. But now it's the judgment of the living nations on earth. And he sets up the throne of his glory on Mount Zion, on earth. And he judges all the nations. And, and just look at that for a moment in, in, in Joel chapter 3. Uh, there's just a little expression I want you to look at in the, the beginning of the chapter 2. We can find Joel here. Sometimes it's difficult to just remember which minor prophet comes before which one. But in Joel chapter 3, just before Amos, notice an expression before we come to this uh, judgment seat. But look at Joel chapter 3 and verse uh, 2. Notice the heading, verse 1, it's in those days. Vegetation, and then what's left of that, the next uh, stage of their growth, eats the next part of the vegetation, and the, the last stage of their growth, uh, they eat everything. So the land is left without anything to sustain life. Uh, and th this, of course, reminds us of what we've been noticing with regard to the day of the Lord. It's a day of judgment, a day of wrath, a day of punishment. Uh, and the day of horror. Uh, so we have famine, and of course, as you know, what results from famine, you've got uh, 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 death and plague and sickness and uh, just uh, in inflation in the economic realm and all that sort of thing. So that, that is a picture of the day of the Lord in chapter one. And then in chapter two, the uh, uh, invasion of insects turns into an an invading army, oh, a tr tremendous and uh, incredibly uh, fierce army. Uh, they, the, the description of them is, is quite striking, and many people have drawn a lot of uh, inferences from that, that they, they, they 
climb upon the walls and climb in the windows and it seems as though they're part of the aerial it could be a, uh, actually uh, a, a, a military force that is made up of, uh, of airplanes and helicopters and all that sort of thing and we'll probably be looking a little bit, bit, bit at that time and I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. He says, I will gather, the Lord speaking, I will get also gather all nations, all nations, notice that, because we're going to be coming to that tomorrow, Lord willing, when we're talking about Armageddon. Tomorrow I want to talk basically about three subjects, the tribulation, that is the first half of the 70th week, the first three and a half years, and then the great tribulation of the last three and a half years, or the time and times and half a time, or 42 months, or the 1260 days, all the same period of time. Uh, and then I want to talk about Armageddon and the following events. So here we have all nations, all nations gathered against Jerusalem. Uh, and I, he says, I will also gather all nations. And in Matthew 25, as he sits on the throne of his glory, all nations are judged. He said, I bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. I take that to be the valley of Jezreel. Nobody's ever quite there. Apparently figured that out, but it has to be when you look at other scriptures. That area, uh, really, the valley that stretches from Petra down uh, in the, the country of Jordan now in the south uh, east corner of uh, Israel, uh, actually in Jordan, that am amazing place that I've always longed to see. And in all my visits to Israel, I've never got there. So, if I may, I would like to. Uh, uh, just finish uh, what I propose to do tonight, just very briefly. I, I would like to talk about Joel and Zechariah. Last time I was with you, mainly we talked about uh, Daniel. You remember we finished up talking about Daniel, about uh, how that in Daniel you have the, the four, uh, four, well, it's the four parts of the image, you remember? The head of gold and the chest of, the, and arms of bronze and the, the and the uh, thighs of silver, and then you remember you had the legs of iron and uh, the toes, of ten toes, and so on. And we so and we talked about the world empires and the, how it, when you come to chapter seven, those uh, four parts of the beast are, are seen as the four uh, f four parts of the image are seen as the four beasts: the lion, Babylon, and the the, the bear, Medo-Persia, and the leopard uh, with. Uh, uh, Greece, and then the indescribable, the terrible beast, the Roman Empire, and so on. Uh, and then we noticed, uh, we looked, looked, talked about the 70 weeks, remember, okay. And then we went to Ezekiel and we talked about the New Covenant, and you remember the wonderful uh, thing that God is going to do for Israel in the coming day, and giving them a new heart, and putting a spirit within them, causing them to love his laws, and to prosper them physically, materially.